Welcome everybody to the Scale Up Show. This is your host, Ryan Saley, and I have a very special guest with me today. I have Alex Castro. Alex is the co-founder and CEO of M Corp, a dynamic and thoughtful author and alignment expert. He's creator of the REM score method uh, and one of the best-selling authors of that. And on top of it too, has been deep into AI and working on business use cases with a new book that he's got coming out later this year called The Art of Possible. Did I get that right? The Art of, yes, the Art of Possible, yes. um, which I think is absolute fire because it's about identifying how businesses can actually implement the all-inclusive sexy word of AI right now. Alex, welcome. Happy to have you on the show, man. Thank you so much for uh, having me on and I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, dude. I love what we were talking about on the uh pre-show prep uh, and Great. retrospect, I probably should have recorded it all and then listened to myself <laughs> as a side product, but you're going to probably cover a lot of this uh, in the show. So let's do a real quick revenue rundown so folks understand where you're at in the stage of the journey. So where are you guys at in terms of your annual revenue? Well, right now uh, we're a 20 year company um, and we are kind of uh, migrating our way to $100 million. So uh, awesome. we're going to we're going to be in that window at some point in the next 18 months. Yeah, Love it, man. And then yeah. what's your primary revenue growth go to market strategy? Our go to market strategy largely is, how, you know, really is about the art of the possible. It's, you know, how are we enabling uh, companies that have data and automation, AI, intelligent automation strategies, uh, and really helping them uh, realize those visions without steering them towards a solution that we've got a lot of you know, bench or resale capability with, right? So uh, in many cases, you know, you'll have firms that, that'll steer you towards a, a big brand because that's, you know, that's what they've hired into their workforce and that's what they want to leverage and that's what they want to sell you regardless of whether that actually works. We, we tend to be uh, more nimble on that side and we actually match the solution uh, to the customer rather than force feeding a, a particular platform. Okay, excellent. And so yeah. are you, is your motion, is it outbound predominantly or what's your customer acquisition method? Really, it's, it's largely outbound and, you know, we get a lot of contact from uh, speaking at conferences, you know, publishing books, publishing papers, um, engaging in uh, deeper dialogues around larger issues. So, um, you know, we do a lot of COVID data. Uh, collection and correction and automation through automation, intelligent automation. Uh, and that works, you know, for our customers in healthcare uh, and public health uh, nationally. Um, we do work in banking finance in terms of, again, intelligent automation and, and uh, really helping them accelerate a lot of, of, of tech to market. Um, and, you know, we work with, um, uh, manufacturing clients that really want to reduce their risks uh, in terms of, you know, sort of new idea, go to market uh, by understanding, you know, what biases are they applying in, in the context of, of developing new products and, and getting those rolled out and how do they mitigate those biases so that they're not spinning for a long time in, the, in you know, in their development process. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. Love that. So yeah. walk us through your solution in like, a verbal paragraph or less, if you will, and you kind of identified who it serves, but can you just give a little bit of an example or a little more tangible, tactical kind of components of what your solution does? Yeah, you wow. bet. So, you know, really, uh, you know, foundationally, we are a services firm and we have developed uh, IP products and, and solutions within the context of those services. And so, uh, largely what we deal with is how do you collect data correctly and data that has enough quality that you can actually feed it into a AI model or develop an AI model? Uh, how do you create or develop automation to replace a lot of those sort of, you know, uh, menial functions and release staff to do more advanced work? Um, you know, you know, what I shared with you a little bit in the pre-show is that we see that there's anywhere from a 12 to 30 percent uptick in customer engagement when automation kicks in, meaning that in many ways people fear that automation will eliminate jobs. But what in, in fact it does is it creates more demand from the customer set back into the into the company. So now that you've done that sort of digital transformation work, 
where you're you're going from manual to automation in terms of a lot of these functions. And then you need to feed into the business transformation component of how do I retool my operations? How do I retool my go to market? How do I retool my entire customer model? Because the demand increases in those contexts. And so uh, we work a lot in both that digital and business transformation space in relationship to data, AI, intelligent automation, automation. And, you know, we can go through the, what's the difference between all of those things. <laughs> well, you probably feel like the, the hot chick at the party right now with uh, everything that's going on with open AI and, and basically the uh, 10,000 AI tools that are released every day. And has that yeah. been a, a flood of interest on, on your end or, or what are you kind of seeing from that? You know, what we're seeing is a lot of cautious interest, right? Um, the, there's one, there, you know, there was a, a recent stat that, that really was uh, eye-opening in many ways is that every 48 hours, there is another version of intelligent automation or uh, artificial intelligence AI being deployed, right? And so every 48 hours, the growth rate, which typically in any other market would have been every three months or six months, you know, in, in the AI automation, intelligent automation space is every 48 hours. It's changing and rapidly getting wow. faster. We went from three so, to eight hours. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, one, it's because it's new. You know, there's a lot. Two is that uh, with OpenAI and ChatGPT, really what happened there was that suddenly a bridge was constructed by which uh, AI, in sort of hyper quotes really there, was uh, normalized for you know the the consumer base right like people could actually interact with something that they perceive to be ai um it, you know it's chat gpt is is advanced algorithmic work it's not really pure ai but for most people it, it gives them a sense of like okay how do you actually apply well, like what does ai do right and the best you know kind of use cases in there right now you know are either you know, college kids or high school kids, and then marketing teams, you know, and writing, uh, you know, a lot of uh, chat GPT content, like our own marketing teams are leveraging chat GPT to uh, create new content. Um, it does it is it a one to one translation? Absolutely not. But it, you know, it's, it's beginning to explore what can it what can it do? Yeah, no, I, I've seen that myself too. And like, like I told you in the, the pre-show, like I've, I've, I've identified like numerous use cases of like eight hours of work you could do in 20 minutes, as long as mm -hmm. you know the right way to do it. Now mm -hmm. there's obviously yeah. a learning curve if you're doing it from scratch, but yeah, there's right. some definite content use cases that you see all the time. And, um, you mentioned your team's using it. How, how large is your team right now? We've got about 350 people uh, across the country, uh, okay. and uh, yeah, I mean the the velocity of engagements today is is pretty aggressive. And I think that one of the other things that's really impacting the market, you know, um, and you know, obviously the relevancy of what I'm about to say is time based, but um, you know, the the challenge with financial institutions today is that active capital, working capital, has become uh, very strained. Right. Mm -hmm. So unless you're in a very high cash flow industry or high cash flow business uh, and, and you don't have a deep dependency on investment, um, either debt or anything else, um, you know, your ability to, you know, your go to market motion uh, is is very impaired right now and the ability to keep up and make those leaps necessary. Um, and so, you know, for us. Uh, you know, we have the benefit of, of having been in business for 20 years, self-funded. We don't have any investors um, and we don't have any debt. And so, wow. we, awesome. you know, we have a lot of, uh, you know, we have a war chest that allows us, you know, to, to have uh, the resources to really uh, advance certain concepts. But more importantly, it's advancing those concepts, not for, pure growth, but it was also for enhancing our customers' outcomes in, in their business. You know, we've had many, many customers who have been using our automation solutions <coughs> and intelligent automation solutions. And 
you know, they've like double or triple down, you know, they said, Hey, look, can you bring in more automation? Can you, can you accelerate the re and reduce our dependency on people to do these manual things? And, um, and so our, our reinvestment and our ability to reinvest has really allowed for customers to get the benefit of that. And, and, you know, just to give an example, you know, the models that we tend to use and the thing that we tend to believe in is that customers in, in intelligent automation and automation space today should not be paying for software and services to implement that, those solutions, right? They should be paying for the transactional value of the solution, meaning mm -hmm. that, you know, as um, your automation, intelligent automation is intaking those those data points based on the volume of intake of data and or uh, how the data is being addressed through automation um, that you should be paying on those transactions and not for the tech. Right. So I kind of I kind of equate it to the fact is like you want to pay for the water coming out of the faucet, not the infrastructure getting the water to your house. Right. And that's that's what we're seeing as a significant shift in today's model. Uh, operating model is that to really keep up with the velocity of automation, intelligent automation and AI, the days of buying software, implementing, honing, tuning, all that kind of stuff simply cannot keep up with, you know, the changes in, in the velocity of the market. So, yeah. Well, so I got, I get two follow-up questions there. And I, I think those are great points. One, like, you know, what's what's a tactical give, give me an example of like a tactical outcome you know that your solution is has created for one of your clients right and you know you don't have to give the name of the customer obviously but just more so just like okay this is what we did this is how long it took this was the tangible outcome from the intelligent automation and then this was the results they received we'd just love to hear that from your perspective yeah absolutely you know we have a customer that collects uh healthcare data and Typically, they had uh, either individuals on a phone or face to face collecting the um, the sort of the input data, um, and they also had you know third party resources that were providing that data to them. And you know anybody who's listening, um, you know for the listener, you know you've probably experienced the fact that you know data intake a lot of the times is incomplete or is incorrect, mm -hmm. right? And what was happening with this customer is that, is that they were intaking data at a high volume and really realizing that once they got it, you know, they, you know, they had this sort of this uh, data lake that they were creating out of it, that once they started to really to take a look at their data and pump that into their very fundamental analytics, that they really weren't getting a lot of insight out of it. And they were trying to figure out what was going on. And the net effect is that the, the way the data was being collected, especially from third party um, uh, participants and and by the intake specialists was, you know, they were they were doing a lot of the bare minimum, leaving a lot of stuff out and or categorizing things incorrectly um, from a manual process. Right. And so once we began to uh, convert a lot of those manual processes into an intelligent automation solution, you know, went from a 68% quality level to a 97% quality level. And what happened then is that the bulk of their staff could now turn from doing data cleansing and data prep to actually doing analytics and pumping out a lot more insight into the business, which was feeding um, sales functions. It was feeding their marketing um, and allowing them really to understand customer behavior um, but more importantly, in the product development side, it allowed them to really tune what was the uptick in certain, you know, products being offered by which market, by which uh, profile. Um, and that then began that sort of just very rudimentary slice and dice effect that, you know, gave them better direction to, to tune in their market. The net effect there was that, you know, they were able to really increase targeting much more effectively in their marketing campaigns. Um, but they began to also dwindle down products that just simply weren't performing, you know, which yeah. before they were just speculating on. I mean, they, because the data just didn't support any kind of outcome in their analytics. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. And I could, 
I could totally see that. So instead of yeah. plugging their fingers in the dam where the leaks were, <laughs> yeah. right, on the data side integrity, they actually could do their job and think strategically and then apply that to the business, right? And and it was beyond the fact it's like, well, the data really isn't telling us anything. It's like, well, the challenge is that the data is the data that you have is not set up to tell you anything, right? Because it just gets um, it just gets glossed over, you know. When you have repetitive functions, you know, where you're as simple as taking an invoice in and getting it into your ERP, right? Um, there's a lot of, you know, mistakes that get made, the speed by which that data gets entered, um, the completeness of information, you know, people, you know, kind of take, well, that's good enough and moving on. It, and the challenge is those people that are doing a lot of that data ingestion don't necessarily always understand what the purpose of the information is, you know, or the data is for. And so when it actually gets to a stage where they need to rely on that data to actually start to make data-driven decisions, they can't because the insights are so skewed, right? So it's mm -hmm. not reliable. And yeah. so then it, it, then you go back, well, my gut's telling me this and my gut's telling me that. And it's, then the whole situation begins to unravel and it's just not, it's not how companies today need to be able to apply data, create information so that they can make better decisions. You know, the, the market velocity is too high. And so if you're, if you're off in terms of what data you have, uh, you're, you're probably making some large, you know, assumption based decisions, which ine inevitably are going to cost you more money. So. Great point. Great point, Alex. And so as a, as a follow up to that, you highlighted how rapid AI is changing and how mm. fast it's accelerating in the marketplace. Yeah. How do you keep up? Well, it's really understanding um, more around what you want to do with it, right? So you have automation. There's there's these different categories, right? So you have automation. Automation typically deals with putting a bot into play that uh, is doing something very functionally simple, right? So how am I merging data records or how am I uh, taking an invoice again and automating that into the ERP or some mm -hmm. manual function that somebody's doing in a repetitive flow, which, you know, may a task that may be taking somebody four hours a day to do, you know, with a bot in automation takes you, you know, 10 minutes, right? So you have that productivity gain. <laughs> Excuse me. And so where that goes is then it goes into intelligent automation, right? So as an example, if I go to a drive up and I'm talking to a person, right? There's always that joke around, does the person understand what it is that, um, you know, you always get the wah, 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 you know, it's like, yeah, yeah. no, 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 I wanted this other thing, right? <clears throat> and then you get to the window and did you get the right thing? Did you get the right coffee? Did you get the right Never. sandwich? Whatever. It may be. Yeah. So he's wrong. <clears throat> right. Well, with intelligent automation now, that works the same thing with automation, but you're adding a very light layer of AI in there, which is actually responding in a voice back to the person and saying, hey, let me see if I got that right. So, you know, everybody's endured the awful call tree that you call in somewhere and it's an automated voice and you're like, mm -hmm. you know, the jokes of somebody saying, you know, assistance or whatever, you know, it's going on. Um, you know, intelligent automation goes well beyond that. And so it, it actually interacts with the, with the customer and actually intakes the data correctly in a way that is, is clear and, and can actually be automated into a workflow. Is then really moving more into how do you treat that information? So with some customers right now, what we're developing is a digital wallet where they are creating an NFT, uh, non-fungible token, out of their birth certificate. They're mm -hmm. creating an NFT out of their healthcare record. They're creating an NFT out of their financial data, and it's in their wallet. And now in a secure environment that they can then go into the metaverse and they can actually have meetings like this in the metaverse um, and run interactions and making purchases in that sort of Web3 metaverse environment. Um, and that is a very advanced model and Web3 adoption is still very, you know, speculative in terms of what it will do. Uh, what we like to call it is sort of Web 2.5, right? In the sense that it's mm -hmm. a little bit more past Web2, uh, but not quite Web3. And, and so that advancement um, 
requires a different level of, of application. Regardless of any of those three, what we advocate for is that whoever you are getting this content from, you know, in the sense of these models and this output, is that you pay for the output, not for the services or the software. And so really where the biggest change is in the model as a, as a, you know, as a leader is that you're not buying projects anymore. You're not the old thinking of, you know, I'm going to go get software or get my IT department to go deploy this thing. That's not going to keep up with the velocity of what happens because your own procurement procedures take time. Your own project procedures take time. And the eventuality really is that we're moving towards a model where you're buying an engine, clicking it into what you want to do, utilizing that engine, and then the vendor is tuning that engine for you on a continuum, but you're not having to handle the infrastructure around that. And so that's the thing that's, that's really helping companies keep up with the pace, you know, to your, to your question of so, what, like, what's, you know, how's it working? Like, like prime example, like what's happening with open AI's large language yeah. model, right? Where they're just yep. tapping into the infrastructure. You see yep. um, all sorts of other ones that are popping up and then, you know, even Elon Musk buying his, what, 10,000 CPUs uh -huh. is obviously working on something as well. So yep. um, it seems like that's what the race is for. So it's long, what, basically what you're saying, long story short. And then there's the cloud providers that have yep. embedded AI within there as well. Um, so what you're basically saying is just like, hey, the best way to keep up, plug into one of the big infrastructure components and then, you know, adapt and modify with a provider on top of that with what you need as an organization. Is that, That's is right. that a good summary of it? In essence, yeah, because I mean, the horsepower you need both from a technology standpoint, but also from logistics and people standpoint, you know, having AI scientists available, mm -hmm. people who can tune a neural network model, who can tune all of this stuff, having those people resident or contracting that out, like that whole process doesn't match the speed by which you need value created from the level of investment because the level of investment is not um it's not cheap and the failure rate is very high and yet you as a business need to be able to claim the the utilization of either automation intelligent automation or ai to keep up with the perception of are you still relevant in the process and it doesn't matter if you're a, a business, a consumer uh, entity that's selling online uh, or a business to business entity that's, you know, helping customers, you know, with with their challenges. Um, if you are not perceived of being in that sort of AI wave right now, you know, your relevance to a prospect is very low. Like it's like, well, these other folks are using AI to do these things and these things and these things. And AI just gets used as this big, broad brush. And, you know, again, most people just don't, they don't have context for it. I mean, you know, open AI and chat GPT really provided that context a little bit better, but still people questions like, okay, great. What, what, what else do I do with this? Exactly. Yeah. I agree with that. So we're almost up on time. Uh, however, I wanted to ask you a question because this aligns with the book you're creating um, of what's possible, right. In, in yeah. terms of, business use cases. So what would you say are like, in your mind, the, the top five most ripe business use cases? Mm. And let's, let's say, look at it more from a functional aspect than a vertical aspect, right? In yeah. terms of like applying, you know, AI to business, what do you think are the biggest um, possibilities now, especially with all the changes over the next six to 12 months that, that you think will just be huge windfalls for companies that implement them? Well, I think from an operational standpoint, um, uh, accounting, finance, any kind of logistics work where you have a lot of data transcription that needs to happen, right? You're doing a lot of intake. And so that may be a customer application, that may be uh, an invoice, that may be, uh, you know, some kind of a, a mechanism that you have a lot of people taking one form and then typing it into something else, right? Mm -hmm. or, or creating a spreadsheet and then importing it into something else. You know, that's hours or hundreds of hours within a business that can be automated into half an hour, you know, and it, you know, and the value of that is that you're, you know, you have a, a, a bot that is, you know, in essence running 24 seven, 
like it doesn't get tired. It doesn't take coffee breaks. It, you know, and, um, it doesn't actually take kick, vacation, yeah. doesn't take vacation. <laughs> it'll kick out where it doesn't understand something and help that, you know, and trigger a manual intervention. So, you know, from an operational standpoint, that's one use case that you can leverage. Um, from a marketing use case, it's everything from creating, uh, uh, refined content and especially like when uh chat gpt really now connects into the web and, and can actually run searches within the context of the web and leveraging the web within the, the user's query um that'll allow for the expansion of development of blog content web content um things that are relevant um you know we have a particular product right now that actually summarizes legal documents into bulleted format so that you don't have to read the 600 pages you can you know simply pump it into our model and it and it kicks out you know a, a bulleted summary on, on what the entire thing is about <laughs> and and so there's that within the the marketing space within the sales space it can really help in understanding specifically what is that customer's need right you know there's that old adage that I hope, you know, people listening to this don't really use that much anymore, but it's like, you know, what's keeping you up at night, right? Like that's that exploratory thing. Well, it's always more beneficial walking into that conversation, knowing what's keeping the prospect up at night Yeah, exactly. right? and what's happening. And right. And so a lot of uh, AI modeling and intelligent automation can help really have a conversation with the prospect without ever having to engage the salesperson, right? So we all know very well that current buyers, the only time they really, you know, the trend right now, especially in, in SaaS products is if they want to make a buy, they want to talk to the salesperson when they're ready to actually make the purchase. But in terms of all the research and that uh, development of funnel, it has to be automated in some context where the buyer is actually doing research, understanding where it can be done and all those things without ever talking to a person. And that's the scariest thing in the world for a C-suite and a sales group, right? In the sense, it's like they're not actually selling. They're just doing running the transaction. And so AI and, and uh, intelligent AI, you know, automation and automation can help in those those Q and A process, give me more information. Can you give me content that shows me where this has been applied in other places, some validation around your product or service. And so it can really help garner that independent communication with the prospect without directly having to put all of that on your web page or, you know, all those kinds of things. And so it ties that marketing and sales process better together. Um, and so I think, you know, just for simplicity sake, you know, I think those are the the top three use cases right now operationally. Um, there's a lot more depth that you can do with it. And for most entities, being able to step, put their toe into that water and actually see value creation from it and creating a better uh, customer experience model out of it is, is really the first step in the process, right? Because okay. if you can enhance the customer experience uh, and in, to some degree, the employee experience, that's when you start to get traction out of the investment. Mm -hmm. Everything else is very, you know, it, it's very nuanced at that point. It depends on how, how deep you want to make that investment. I love that, man. Well, we're just about up on time. Last question is, um, you know, where do you see the future of AI going over the next six to 12 months? And what should companies start doing today to prepare themselves and, and start to align with all the new changes. Yeah. So, you know, re in recent, uh, you know, over the last month, you know, you've seen and you're going to see a lot more uh, movement towards slowing AI down. And, um, you know, some people are advocating that it, it shouldn't continue in any way, shape or form. Right. And I kind of equate that to the to the, it's like it's like trying to stop climate change. Like there's just too many competing you know, yeah. priorities yeah. in that context, you know, it's like, we all know what the right thing is. And then there's the thing that like, well, I'll do the right thing once I, you know, make my money or whatever it may be. Right. I hate to put it in that, that simplistic of a format, but you know, the, the idea that you're going to stop AI is, is not realistic, but what is really the concern 
is where I think most folks just really don't understand where the, because everybody's afraid of Skynet and the Terminator showing up, right? Like that's what they vision from AI and, and that kind of a thing. And that's not really the thing, right? It's not that the computers are going to take over and suddenly, you know, we're all, uh, you know, slaves to a machine. The biggest risk to AI lies in security and the ability, for example, let's say that you and I are not doing a podcast, but you and I, you're my therapist, I'm getting therapy, or you're my financial advisor, or you're my doctor, or you're some person that has sensitive information or closed circle information, right? And we're doing this in the metaverse, right? So today we live in a world of Zoom and, and Teams and, and um, um, video chats that, you know, we can do this. But now we're going to move into the metaverse and we're going to be in this sort of uh, um, suspended reality place. And we're doing this and you're an avatar. How do I know who you are? Mm -hmm. Like it may have your face and your name, right? And you've addressed this in the best way possible. The challenge in, in the AI space, especially with the metaverse and Web3, is that that space is not, has no governance and there's no recourse. So if I go in there and I give you information or I give you money or I, you know, whatever it is that we exchange and something goes wrong, there is no way for any government in in the planet to go in and police that in any way, shape or form. It wow. is pure, uncontrolled space. And so in the next year or so, you're going to see a lot more around um, defining where can AI be applied? How is it monitored? <clears throat> who owns the data? And that's where the whole blockchain space comes into play digital wallets and all those things. And so there's going to be need to take a step back really in understanding how do we monitor that while that is happening though, there is a lot of use for automation and intelligent automation to continue to progress and get a better customer experience without exposing your customer base to a massive risk model by which now a, an AI bot can get all of your information, sell it and suddenly you know, your bank account's empty and your driver's license goes to a different house and, you know, everything else in your world goes upside down. That's the real risk. And that's the real fear. And it's very real. It's, it's not a made up thing like that. You know, it's, not, it's always that sort of rule that there's that 1% that's ruining it for the 99%. Right. And that's the, that's the biggest challenge in that space today. Love that. Well, um, I don't love that that's happening. You know, or the potential. <laughs> I mean, I just I love your perspective, man. And so, yeah. Alex, it was awesome having you on the show. Where can people find you? Where can they find out more about MCorp? And then we'll wrap things up. Yeah, you know, I'm on LinkedIn, easy to find there. And then it's www.the-mcorp.com. Um, we're going to have some very, very exciting announcements coming up here in, in May um, and the release of some stuff. And, you know, we'll be... Uh, you know, as if you're interested, really interested in understanding the AI world, the intelligent automation world, the metaverse world, um, we're building out an entire metaverse space that you can actually come in virtually, meet with us, and actually see demos and do things in the metaverse using coin based interactions um, that'll allow you really to understand. You know, how does it work to, to do a transaction with a Coinbase component? How do you do the blockchain work? How do you do all of the secure contract work? How do you work or meet in the metaverse at the very least and be able to work in this sort of ether that gives you more flexibility as a company and how do you monetize that? And so um, a lot of those exciting things will be coming out here in, in May of, of 23 and going forward. So that's yeah. wild, man. Yeah. Um, so love that. So May is literally a couple days around the corner. Uh, yeah. By the time this is released, this this should be out. So um, yeah. we'll put it in the show notes as well. So um, yeah. so you have to share that with me after the show. But but Alex, it was awesome having you on the show. I love your thank perspective, you. the depth of your knowledge in terms of what you're talking about. And um, thank you for being on, man. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you so much for, for sharing uh, this time. Yeah. And uh, we will see you all on the next episode.